Matthew. A gift from Etuken Eh, the Earth Mother. Through Matthew, we become world breakers. Our talents are amplified, our flaws deepen. Some of us inspire and lead, others invent and explore. Many manipulate, torment, and kill. I am Kutulun, a descendant of the great Genghis Khan. I will reunite the Mongol hordes. I will finish the great Khan's conquest. I will bring forth the advent of the Kenneth. What is going on, everyone? Thanks for answering the Lobby of Hobbies. And I am Jazz, your host today. And I want to say it's been a while since I've done one of these live streams, and we are going to be live with the designer of the game that you just saw the trailer for. And this is World Breakers Advent of the Kenneth. This is a customizable card game that I've had the privilege, the honor to, you know, just check out and preview. And I'm going to put a full disclosure. Yes, it was a paid preview, a sponsored preview. But I'm going to give you my honest, you know, takes here as we talk with the designer, Ellie Amir. So let's just jump right into it. For those that are watching, you can feel free to comment in the stream below. We're going to ask questions, share the stream. You know what it's like here at the Lobby of Hobbies. We are about sharing the games that we enjoy and hopefully people discover something worth checking out. So if you're here watching the stream because you believe in World Breakers, then right now you need to share this um, link for this stream so that other people can find out about this game. And let's just jump right in it with the designer, Ellie. Let's get to it. What's going on, Ellie? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I'm glad to finally have you. I know we've been in contact through emails and whatnot, but World Breakers, this is, we're in the final week, right? A couple of days left, three days before this campaign closes. Um, and I wanted to get down and, and speak with you and just get a little, little bit to know about you, but also the game in general. This is your opportunity, right? I'm going to give you the stage to kind of, you know, I guess, give your little uh, elevator pitch a little bit. First, let's talk about you, Ellie. Who is Ellie Amir? So hi, I'm Ellie, and uh, I'm the designer of Paul Bakers, as you pointed out. I've been a gamer since I was six. I got the Dungeons and Dragons red box, and I played the, the heck out of that game. And then somewhere around fourth grade, Magic the Gathering was imported to Israel, uh... and I started playing that. Uh, that was pretty much my life for the next, I don't know, eight, ten years or so. All of my friends played Magic, uh, both because that's where I met them. And if someone became my friend outside of magic, they usually started playing magic uh, just <laughs> by like osmosis. And um, somewhere around 18, it was when Catan was finally imported to Israel. So mm -hmm. quite a long lag from uh, the United States. This is, uh, let's see, this is already like the early 2000s. So much later than the US and definitely later than Germany. And from there, it was other games. It was Kalis, and um, it was um, even Twilight Imperium. And uh, I've been a gamer since forever. Nice. That's that's awesome. So let's just so you talking about the game. So Magic: The Gathering. You know, Dungeons and Dragons. You know, it's it's crazy because my my intro to gaming was more like um, Ticket to Ride and things like that. And then I was always afraid of these. You know. Magic the Gathering, to me, I always heard the word, it's going to be a money pit, right? It's just going to sink, you know, drain money out of your pocket. Um, so that kind of scared me. But I did take a jump into a game called Dice Masters, which was a collectible card game from WizKids, a collectible card and dice building game. And I played competitively, you know, nationally, world's events and whatnot. But um, I guess that kind of made my, my mind branch out outside of what the, the games that I was kind of looking at. And I started venturing into other things. And... When I started dying out of that scene, 
man, a whole world of board games opened up for me. Um, you know, and I started trying other um, customizable or collectible card games, some LCGs, things like that. So I'm not new to this, you know, genre or this world. Um, but other than some of the games, what, what games have you been playing currently? I've, obviously, we know World Breakers is on your mind, but what games outside of that do you normally get to the table um, when you're obviously weren't taking the time designing World Breakers? Well, Inat, my wife and I have been slowly going through Pandemic Legacy Season 2. Okay. And uh, it's interesting because we started playing it back in like December 2019. We did a few months and then our entire schedule was derailed. <laughs> Something happened in the world, which was pretty ironic because we stopped playing Pandemic Legacy <laughs> Season 2 because of COVID. Yes. And then if like finally about a year later, we went back to the game, we got all the way to October, and then we got sick with COVID at the uh -huh. end of 2020. <laughs> um, so we're slowly going through that. And um, what else? I uh, I actually quit Magic the Gathering because okay. it was a money pit. And uh, <laughs> back in 2004, right before I started college, I literally wasted all of my money on Magic the Gathering. And I was broke for two months not my girlfriend at the time now my wife paid all the bills and everything <laughs> but over the pandemic i did go back to magic arena and uh i've been making sure to monitor my expenses um i love innovation okay. so i think one of my favorite games innovation and one of my I, the reason i like it so much many reasons but one of them is that it's very easy to get to the table okay. um, especially when it's only just one or two or three players um it sets up easily it plays easily and it's always exciting and fun so i think that that's that's a good survey of what's going on right now it's interesting that you mentioned innovation innovation i have in my collection um a, um i tim if you've ever heard of um tim over at meepleville cafe from las vegas he also runs dice tower west he is a huge fan of innovation that's one of his biggest uh you know games that he enjoys so just off of his sheer you know enamor for the game i did purchase a copy but I, i'm still trying to find someone to learn the game but i do know it's on board game arena so i'm you know i'm gonna look hopefully get some people you know to learn that one but i'm very interested in it um so you and, know i've got um yeah sure wait the camera is reversed so it's difficult to see but it's right here oh, oh that's it right there that's here the box <laughs> Nice. And yeah, it's it's a box of just it's just cards. So, you know, you think it's a card game, but it, I, from what I hear, there's a lot of depth to the game, which is something yes. that I enjoy about games that pack a heavy punch in a small box. Um, that's something that I always appreciate, right? Because sometimes you get these big, big box games and there just can be so much, um, I guess, aesthetically in there, right? But sometimes the gameplay is a little bit lackluster. So that's, you know, I appreciate games like that. Um, now, we're here at the Lobby of Hobbies to talk about games, so we also talk about other hobbies. What other hobbies are you into? Obviously, we know designing, but anything else? Um, I finally got back into reading books. OK. <laughs> I, uh, I'm ashamed to admit that uh, it got replaced by a few other things, but um, I, I'm back into that. I'm, I'm reading cast by Isabel Wilkerson right now, um, okay. which is fascinating. Uh, it's talking about the cast systems in the United States, in India, and in Nazi Germany, and finding the parallel between them. So I think it's a very actual book for, honestly, anyone, but especially if you live in the United States, um, caste and race and gender are all part of our lives here. So that's pretty important. And uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm all listening to you. <laughs> yeah. And um, I've been I've been running a business for quite a while, for several years now, and sadly that became a black hole for <laughs> time. So many yes. of my hobbies were put on hold. Uh, so I came back to reading recently. I came back to playing. I played the violin. So okay. I stopped in 2018, and I finally got back to it a few months ago. And uh, my violin teacher Liz was elated. She said that people almost never come back once they quit, especially for such a long period. So um, so that's fun. We're doing some Vivaldi now. Nice, nice. So that's, you know, so we got a, we got a designer, a musician, and 
No, someone who just loves to just jump into the books. I, I love it. I love it. A little bit of variety of everything, it, which is awesome that you find in this hobby, right? You find people who have a a wide spectrum of the things that they're into. And a lot of times that people think, you know, you know, we think you, we, I guess we quote unquote it called nerd culture, right? And I always used to, when I was growing up, I was a, what they call your typical jock, right? And I used to look at people, kids who gamed and played magic and all this stuff. I was like, oh, those are just the nerds. Like, I don't even understand what they're doing. But, you know, when I got into college, I started playing games and look at, you know, I'm in the nerd culture and I, you know, I embrace it with everything that is me. My daughter is going to be three. And when she comes to play a board game, I'm like, let's go. I want to embrace that nerd culture with you. But it's awesome. So let's just start diving into, um, you know, the mind behind World Breakers. So what this design, what inspired you to even talk about designing? Was World Breaker something that's been on your mind for a while? Was it a customizable game that you wanted to start with or, you know, is it the, the one that just happened to fall into your lap when the, when the, the inspiration came? That was always the dream, um, by all means, since I, I, I love Magic the Gathering and Magic really opened up the whole customizable card game hobby for me. And back in the day, back in the late 90s, there were no living card games like Fantasy Flights franchises and Doomtown. It was all CCGs. And... I had a huge collection in Israeli standards. Then I moved to the U.S. and saw what a huge collection really is. But at least for a kid living in Israel, it was big. And it was also very diverse. I had magic, but I also had Middle Earth and Babylon 5 and Wheel of Time and uh, Age of Empires and Shadowrun. And I can keep going. So <laughs> I've always been an avid collector of CCGs. And for me, the, the dream was always to create a customizable card game. Eventually, again, somewhere around college, I identified how problematic that hobby can be mm -hmm. and how it has a very significant and somewhat unethical gambling elements to it. And thankfully, I, I later discovered Fantasy Flight and okay. their living card games, which... Yes are much more accessible, games like Android Netrunner, where you pay once and you get all of the cards. So okay. there's no money cards, there's no booster packs, there's no gambling. And it's always been the dream to create this kind of customizable card game. Um, after all of us got sick at the end of 2020, we recovered, things got better. I decided that it's time to stop dreaming, <laughs> actually <laughs> act on what I want to do. And I started pursuing World Breakers more seriously then. It's it's interesting because I was reading some of um I guess the design diary, I guess you would call it, right on your on your World Breakers uh website, you know, talking about um the game, like the, the concept behind it a little bit bit of you know this customizable idea which you know i'm always hey hey i love th the idea of customizable games because i'm not you know like you said you know just draining money out of my pocket but the idea that um you know the design you took it a with a little bit of that magic the gathering for those who are magic the gathering fans and also android netrunner which is a game that i was recently introduced to i you know it's uh I, I started to read the rules and i was like oh my goodness this is too much it was it felt like it was overwhelmed all the all the the verbiage and terminology <laughs> and then i decided to you know what um, let me just kind of sit back but understanding when i was previewing your game i'm going to be honest um the the concepts I, I saw the the netrunner concepts in there with the the turn structure and things like that the 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 economy system that's in there but it honestly sparked me to get into getting Netrunner actually to the table, um, you know. But I know that Netrunner is a huge, um, you know. I guess you want to say an inspiration for this game and Magic. Um, so, what about that Netrunner economy system that you that was it that you saw that you wanted to bring in? But I know you don't have a straight. Hey, I'm going to do my four my four clicks or my three clicks, dependent on if I'm playing the Corp or if I'm playing the Runner and make it a back and forth struggle like that is an interesting design that going back and forth turn by turn and you don't see that a lot in many um you know collectible card games even customizable or lcg style card games you have everybody doing everything you can possibly on your turn before you um hand that priority over to the, the your opponent yeah and i think i think before we talk about that it's worth prefacing um 
World Breakers was previewed by Rich Ham of uh, Rather Runs Through. Mm -hmm. And I really liked one of the things that he said. He said that this is the game that fixes magic, <laughs> which I think I think was a bit of an overstatement, but uh, a, bit, a bit hyperbolic. But I, I appreciate the sentiment. And in many ways, I've been trying to fix Netrunner. And to be clear, Netrunner is not broken in any way. Netrunner is a fantastic game. I think it's the best card game out there. Um, but it is incredibly complicated. And the cognitive complexity that comes with Netrunner is significant. And it turns off many players. Um, the same for Magic the Gathering, the same for many other of these games, customizable card games have a pretty bad rap yes. as far as complexity is concerned. And um, even within the board gaming genre, which is often considered like for the smarty nerds, <laughs> like the math types and so on, yeah, yeah. they have a special role like, oh my gosh, like everyone's looking at board games and then the board gamers are looking at the card gamers. Correct. So reducing cognitive complexity was a big part of it. And I want to thank uh, Jamie Perconti. They've been the rules manager on Wallbreakers and they joined the project a few months ago and they're brilliant. They've, they've done a lot to um, simplify and to make the game more accessible. They kept the heart of the game they kept all the mechanics almost. Like the game plays the same. They just made it simpler. Um, which I think is brilliant. Yeah. So oh go ahead. No, no. Now you have one thing that I, I also noticed in your design notes um, you know, on the website. You have a post that says that you took the concept of um, worker placement games to kind of in ingrain that into the system here in World Breakers. And when I read that, I was like, oh man, you know, I am a huge um, worker placement fan. I think my whole top shelf of games up here that you can't see is worker placements. And starting with uh, Yeto, it just continues worker placement. And then probably on these sidewalls, it's 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 a genre that I love. Um, I love the idea of I act, you act, and I have to kind of um, adjust my strategy to what everyone else is doing at the table. It's not in essence, direct interaction, but there is interaction there, you know, and that's something that I appreciate about that genre. And I do see that in, in World Breakers, for those that are watching or listening or may watch this later, what part of this, let, let's first, before we get into that, let's start, let's, what is the 30 second elevator pitch on World Breakers? If you had someone in the elevator, what 30 seconds are you going to tell them, this is my game, here it is, you know, to spark their interest? Sure. I would tell them that World Breakers is a two-player card game, which is held in an alternate history, 13th century Asia. So it's a brand new setting. It's a place we've never visited before. And in the game, you want to control the board against your opponent. You play different followers that fight each other. You play location cards, which you can develop for power, which is essentially points. And the first player to reach his 10 power wins the game and forever reshapes history. Nice. And and that's, you know, that that battling back and forth, but where in that design elements would you say for someone who is tr strictly a board gamer and says, "Hey, oh man, I just heard Jazz say there's worker placement elements. What part of that game is the design that adds that element into it?" That actually connects to your previous question as well, because you asked about Netrunner and where did the idea to alternate between players came from? Yeah. And that's a that's a mechanic which is very natural for anyone who played worker placement, whether it's Kalis or Agricola or you know, even Wingspan, not a worker placement game, Correct. but a similar idea where you cycle between the players. And it was really about the fusion of the economic engine from Netrunner with this idea of flipping between the players. And what this means is that you have a plan, you have a strategy. Like you want to do these things. And you have to do them in a particular order. You have to take the wood, and you have to take the reed, and you have to build a room, and you have to grow your family, using Agricola as an example. You can't change the order than these things. Yes. But the other players have their own plans. They might want the woods as well. And also, the other players know what you're trying to do. So they might take the wood just so that you don't have it. So there's always that tension between the plan, the sequencing of what you want to do, what your opponent wants to do, how they're going to stop you, how you're going to stop them. 
And yeah. that's the heart of worker placement games for me. And that's the heart of Fall Breakers. And that's one thing that I, I really gravitated to in this design is for me, it, it was that, that back and forth churn structure because I, I have a, you know, I, I have my hand of cards. I know what I want to do and I know to get to, you know, point D I have, you know, those four turns to be able to get to there, but every movement that I get, whether it's gaining the, the mythium or this is the, the resource to, you know, for those that are watching the resource that allows you to um, pay for cards that are going to go into play and do other actions. Um, as I'm gaining this mythium, there's a situation where, oh, now my opponent plays down a card and it's like, oh, I have to do something to react to that card. If not, it's really not going to allow me to get to what I want to do. And I think that's one thing that I appreciate it about the design. That's that's something that's different that I haven't seen. And as I've been playing Netrunner, you know, even there, you're trying to figure out what I'm going to do within my, you know, the clicks that I have um, on my turn structure. This takes that element and it really adds that simplistic layer of strategy to the game because this one isn't one that I think is very difficult to grasp the concept of how to play. It takes uh, 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 you know, some great designs and simplifies it into something that, you know, I think really anybody who's looking to get into the world of a customizable dueling style card game, this offers that. That's just my, and like I said, for those I said, you know, I have previewed this, I, you know, I have done a sponsored preview on my channel, but this is my honest opinion for those that want to take it, take it with a grain of salt. But that's how I see it when I'm, when I've played this game is there is a simplicity to it, but it also offers that, um, that that deep strategy within there as well. Yeah, thank you for all these kind words. And I think you really summed it up very well. Going back to the kind of stereotypes that come with customizable card games, many of them are notorious for the turns becoming longer and longer and longer. And eventually, in some of them, you just sit there and stare at your opponent as yeah. they're doing all their stuff. Um, there's a voice actor slash YouTuber called Sung Wan Chao, and um, he has these two skits about these types of games. One of them is called When Your Opponent Won't Finish You Off in a Card Game. <laughs> and the joke is that one of the players is starting their combo and just won't win. Eventually, their opponent just leaves and like goes to the deli to get a sandwich, and they're still going playing their cards. So that's the kind of dynamic I really wanted to avoid. And in fact, I want to take the opposite approach where it's your turn right now, but it's going to stay your turn for like five, 10 seconds. Then it's going to be your, turn, your opponent's turn and vice versa. So there's very little downtime, unlike many other games, both board games and card games. And furthermore, every decision you make is meaningful from the second the turn begins. We are looking at playtest logs and someone won. We could have traced back the game to like the second turn. Um, like the second action they've taken during the game and say, oh, actually, maybe you should have played it a bit differently. Um, like you had, the, you had the information back then to do something else. So all the decisions matter. There's no time. There's no downtime. It's a very condensed and tense gaming experience. Yeah, and that's what I've that's what I've seen. And you have a various formats. Now we we I heard you talk about the reason why you didn't go, you know, with that CCG model because of that money pit, but also because you know it kind of it, it it has a negative a negative connotation that kind of centers around it. And I know a lot of people kind of try and stay away from that um, because we know we know the heavy hitters, right? It's like how do you compete with Magic, Pokemon, and Yu Gi Oh out there when there are other great games? And trust me, there's other great designs that I've seen. I have a one friend who is like I, I call him a CCG junkie because he consumes them all, and he will tell me this game really needs to be at the forefront. I know. Um, there's one flesh and blood that's starting to rise up and, you know, starting to take a forefront, but still you have to compete with those three heavy hitters. And sometimes there are great games that just get overshadowed by them that never really can get at the forefront. But I have seen the customizable, the LCGs really make a splash and do well, but you have three different formats. You have the pre-constructed, um, the draft and the constructed format. But what is the format do you, that you think, um, people who get into backing this game and playing this game will really, you know, will have the most 
meet or get the most out of? Do you think it's, you know, the draft is really where this game shines? Is it a little bit of all three? Or do you think it's the constructed? Like most of these LCGs, the if they fall flat in the pre-constructed, and it's really where the constructed game is where it all shines. That's a great question. And um, I'll add that there's a fourth format with solo campaign, because uh, yes. it wasn't the preview that you had, but the game also has a 10 chapter solo campaign that you can just play on your own and should entertain you for quite a few hours. Uh, Loving that. Loving that solo mode. I know a lot of people are interested in games that just come with solo modes. That's great. Right. And I'll say it's not for the faint of heart. It's pretty hard. Like we've been dialing, we're playing with the difficulty. It was insanely hard, but we toned it down. It's still quite challenging, I think, even for solo um, professionals. Um, so I had a chance to volunteer as a playtester for Fantasy Flight as they were de developing Netrunner and releasing expansions. And as I was talking to their staff, one of the interesting anecdotes that came up is that many Netrunner players just buy the game box. Okay. They don't buy any of the expansions. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like 90%. So, oh, wow. and their metric was very lenient, like 90% did not buy any expansions, 10% bought at least one. So it's not even the mm -hmm. hardcore tournament players that buy everything, right? It's a very, it's a very minimal um, um, definition. So the game box is designed for maximum replayability for as wide an audience as possible. And... Mm -hmm. If that's the design goal, I should probably cater to at least 90% of the player base. Yep. So I think for many people, the game would be great just if you play the pre-cons. OK. Um, because there's four pre-cons. And that means that there is six different matchups, like six different combinations. Mm -hmm. And in every combination, you can play each side. So it's 12 different ways. If you have like a friend, a partner that you play with, there's 12 different configurations, you can set it up. And each of these is different. Each of these could even be envisioned as a different game. It brings different dynamics. It dif brings different sources of tension. So we usually recommend that players start with the Cthulhuun versus Marco Polo matchup. Okay. And that's a very classic aggro versus defender kind of scenario where Polo is sort of playing tower defense, and Cthulhuun is just rushing with followers. But that's just one of the six. So um, it's very different matchups for the just for the pre-constructed. And I think there's probably hours and hours of replayability just with these. If you want to have a game on your shelf and every few months pull it and play a few games, you can just stick to the pre-cons. Then if you are one of these customizable um card game enthusiasts and you're looking for more meat in your game you have the other game modes and gotcha. one of the things as a card game player one of the things i intimately know is that there's there's two types like there's two separate spheres of card gamers there's the limited players who like playing things like draft and there's the constructed players that just want to have a big pool of cards and customize it any way they want and we're really trying, I'm really trying to cater to both of them. Uh, the game shifts, the game ships with a draft experience out of the box. And that is super unusual. To be honest, I don't know any other customizable yeah. game that does that. Um, so if you do like that kind of competitive draft experience, you can open the box and just literally shuffle all the cards together and you're ready to play a draft format. Yeah, I think wow. that's that's oh, something. No, I think that's something that's that's really good is is having that draft format. And that's something that um, my brothers and I have been really starting to get into is that draft format. We 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 played a lot with the precons, which we enjoyed, um, but that draft format is where we're starting to get into it. Um, I'm I've always been one of those um, what do you call 
net deckers where I would, you know, net deck. And then I would tweak based off of what, what I do. And I, I like to net deck based off of play styles because I like to know what, what works, what, what combos people are doing. But um, that's the type of player I am. And then I always shift around outside of that. But, you know, that's I do love draft. Any game that I've played, I, I've, I've loved that draft format. And I, I really appreciated that this has that element built into that core box which uh, which i thought was really neat um we have we have james over here talking about um vampire rivals he said vampire rivals um he's bought the first two expansions he says a lot of people buy everything or a lot of things for marvel champions but he likes the idea of that flexibility being in a core box which is something that you know it's neat to do to see that you know to see that that's that's there um so I'm sorry, I, I kind of cut you off. Let's continue with what you were saying, Ellie. Um, yeah, and there's also constructed where you can build your deck. And that's something yeah. that many card gamers are familiar with. I really like your comment about the draft and how it opens it up for you. Uh, that's, that's part of it. We've chosen a very accessible draft format uh, for people. And going back to your original question, I would say that that was, the, that was one of the first design decisions we've made that the game is going to be oriented around draft. Constructed actually came later. OK. Because players started asking for it. Mm -hmm. Initially, the game was supposed to be pre-constructed decks. You finish with the pre-cons, you move on to draft, and you draft for your heart's desire. Um, but many players asked for constructed, so we added these rules, and we started playtesting for it as well. Um, many draft formats. Magic is a good example. Their goal is to deliver a game experience, but their chief concern is selling booster packs. Mm -hmm. So many of the cards in the booster pack for Magic are just not very good. And gotcha. when you build your constructed deck, you will never use them. They're, they're junk, pretty much. As yep. soon as the draft is over, they go to the box. You never see them again. Correct. Um, with Wall Breakers, we took the opposite approach. We're following a philosophy called cube drafting. And in cube mm -hmm. drafting, every card matters. So the power level of the draft decks is very similar to constructed decks. It's not like constructed is still a bit stronger, but I would say the average constructed deck can battle an average draft deck and vice versa. Okay. So um, that means that playtesting efforts converge pretty well. When we were playtesting constructed, we playtested draft and vice versa. So in effect, we doubled our playtesting power because those players that loved draft helped with playtesting constructed and vice versa. That's interesting. And I put the, the website down there for those that are interested. It's it's worldbreakersgame.com. And that gives you some, for those that are watching, that gives you some insight to not only some information about the game has the blog post that, that that's where I was kind of reading some of those design insights, but also you can get links to also the discord, the YouTube channel and the, the discord honestly is it's been lively every day with people giving some great insight um, to the game design tips, design ideas, you know, the future of this game, which leads me into my next question. What is the future of world breakers? I'm talking about expansions, organized play, online play, where, what is in that mind, Ellie? Let's be real. So I'll start by saying that even if we don't care about any of that stuff, the game box is designed to be a board game, a self-contained board game. Um, nice. This is not a Ponzi scheme, which is designed to force <laughs> you to get more and more expansions forever. Uh, so again, I'm assuming that 90% of the players are just going to have it on their shelf, and they're going to pull it every few months. And if that's the experience you're going for, you should totally get wall breakers. Gotcha. With that said, <laughs> um, <laughs> with that I'm said, <laughs> yes, um, I'm a competitive player through and through. Mm -hmm. I've been playing Magic tournament since I was ten. Um, I organized Netrunner tournaments. Uh, so when the game came out, I was one of the first people to organize a tournament in the United States and. I organized in New York tournaments for years, including several regional tournaments. Um, I attended the national championship, the world championship for Netrunner. So I think that um, competitive play is a big part of my philosophy. And I definitely have a bunch of plans. I put them on the blog post. So if you want to go and have a look, 
Um, so I think there's two parts to it. One is expansions. Mm -hmm. um, I do plan to release expansions. I, I want the rate of expansions to be reasonable for people to, um, to follow. Okay. Many games just release too much stuff. And one, it's a financial burden because if you release a $15 expansion every month, then that means that your players are spending $180 on your game every year. And I think that's, that's too much money, um, in my opinion. So one part of it is the financial burden. Uh, the other part is that just from a cognitive perspective, it's difficult to stay in touch with so much content. And it's overwhelming for players. Um, Especially, I mean, Magic is a lifestyle hobby. Pokemon, um, Yu-Gi-Oh, these are lifestyle hobbies. People just, that's what they do all the time. Yep. But for a more casual audience, you know, they have other stuff. They have family, they have jobs, like they have other games they want to play, they have books they want to read, they have movies they want to see. They can't just think about your game 24-7. Um, so the goal is to release somewhere between two and three expansions a year. They're going to be much smaller. They're going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 cards. Um, so really keeping it under control. Then the other side of the coin is the organized play. And I already started talking to stores and to distributors because in my mind, online is great. Kickstarter is great to form the seed and the beginning of your community. Gotcha. But if you want a long-term community, you have to work with the stores. You have to have partners. And the goal is to have uh, these um, bi-monthly seasons. So every two months, there's going to be a new season of Wallbreakers. And it's going to have its own rewards. Uh oh, are you there? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. OK, cool. You disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to have its own rewards. And also, it's going to have its own differences in how you play the game. So okay. one way to change the game is to release more cards. And that's what most companies do, because that's how they make money. They just have you buy more stuff. But there is a lot of flexibility in how we design wall breakers. And there's many small things we can do just to create a whole new meta game and a whole new gaming experience. So I hinted at a few of them in the, um, in the blog. Like, we can change the amount of currency of Mythium you start with. We can tweak the rules around deck construction, around gaining standing. Um, there's lots of little levers and knobs we can play with. And the goal is to reshuffle the metagame through these levers between the expansions every two months. And then okay. when expansion comes out, go back to the base rules and let players interact with the new cards on a first setting. That's an interesting, interesting way to do it. Um, you know, you don't see many people um, do it that way. A lot of organized play is not like that. You know, you have your set formats, um, and that's pretty much it. But that's a that's a, a a neat way to think of it to have you know a little bit of variability, variability, right? That's the word. Um, but leading up to that release, and then when that release, going back to the you know, so people can kind of get used to, you know, that new that new card pool as they get continue to play. Um, what about online play? Is this something that you know, you've talked, think, thought about offering maybe a platform where people can get to know the game. Like, I, I'll be honest, I don't know something. I don't know from where that falls in the line of, you know, there's always that that talk of, you know, do I put something online because pe are people going to buy it? But then you have some people who say, hey, when you put it online, they're more inclined to buy the physical. I, I, I know people who play, you know, card games. That's all they play. And while they have that um, choice of playing online, they are diehard. I have to play this game physical, and they will still play it physical. Um, any any uh, words on that? Yeah, so the game is available through Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia. But I think that's different from what you're asking. A big part which is missing from these platforms is the rules engine. Uh, you, have, yeah. you want the interface to manage the rules for you. And um, I'm looking into Board Game Arena. OK. That, that might be one option. And also, um, for people who play Netrunner, Game of Thrones, there's online platforms. Uh, one of them is called gentechie.net. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they let you play these games and they take care of the rules. Mm -hmm. So I hope that within a few months, we'll be able to offer wall breakers either through BGA or through one of these more custom platforms. Um, there is already excitement from the players, and some of them have discussed the option of doing it themselves. Um, okay. And I told them that I'll give them every point of support that they can. There seems to be this tension around if people will play online, they're not going to buy the game. I really don't believe in that. Okay. I think that I think that players who care about your game know that you need money to make <laughs> the game happen. Yeah, and they know that. Nobody's nobody's nobody is in here to become a multimillionaire, right? Um, yep. That is not the outlet for striking rich and uh, <laughs> buying the act and so on. Um, everyone in this hobby are here for the passion and the excitement and the community and the camaraderie between all of us. Uh, so I know that I've been playing games online, games which are available for free, especially through Tabletop Simulator. And then I bought them. And um, one notable me, example. Me too. Me yeah. too. Um, one notable example is Through the Ages. So mm -hmm. Through the Ages has an online app now, but for years it didn't. It was available through a service called um, Board Games Hyphen Online or something. Okay. And I played, I think, dozens or hundreds of games of Through the Ages. Um, and eventually, I bought the game. I never even opened it. <laughs> <laughs> it was sitting shrink wrapped on my shelf. And then I lent it to a friend, and that friend left the US and moved to Sweden or something. So they still have the game. <laughs> and, you know, it's fine because I can count on one hand the number of times I played it physically. Gotcha. But because I played it so much online through a free platform, I just bought it because that's the way to support the company. And I'm hearing the same stories from people who play Dominion online and innovation online. More often than not, the online platform serves as a tool for essentially marketing for yeah. the physical game. And people are going to buy it. Um, Hanabi, the crew, both of them are available for free online. And I hear again and again that people bought them because of the online play. Yeah, I, that's one thing that I that I see a lot that I've that I've seen a lot is people were you know saying um, the online play has has sparked their interest to dive more into the game physically. You know, it's a lot of people like to learn on platforms like BGA. I for myself, uh, you know, I, I'm playing more and more on BGA to you know learn games, and then um, I'll get together with a friend to play it online and then now i have the concept of the game that i can actually now teach my physical copy to people you know much easier you know i i, I enjoy i the best way for me is to read that rule book but man if i can get someone to just teach me a game and i can absorb it that i love that um and i think that's also one thing that's great about you know these type of card games you know is that you, you only need one person to understand the rules and then sit across someone and say, hey, this is kind of what you do. Let's kind of go by a turn structure. And then the game kind of develops organically. And after a few couple hands, you can reset and go jump right into it, which is something that I've seen with World Breakers. It's, it's that game that has been very fairly accessible to those that I have taught. And my brother is one that, you know, he really enjoys going back and forth with this game specifically because it's so easy to, to kind of pick up. And I think that... Oh, so first of all, thank you. And I'm really happy your brother is doing the game um, and you're enjoying it. I think it's important to uh, to be mindful of, of at least two things. One, some people can't afford the game. Correct. And I try to make wall bakers as inexpensive as possible at 30 bucks. And I had people tell me, you should make the game more expensive. 30 is too cheap. And I'm like, yeah, but some people can't afford a game for 30 bucks. And at the end of the day, I just want people to play my game. If they can go online and play the game, and you know they're not going to buy it, that's fine. They're having fun. They're playing my creation. That's, that's totally fine for me. There's going to be enough people who are willing to buy the game and able to buy the game that it's worth it. Another aspect is that some players physically cannot play the game. And it might be for different reasons. One notable reason is because there was a global pandemic and they couldn't see anyone 
and they didn't have anyone in their household who plays games. But yes. even setting that apart, some people just don't have a gaming community around there. I mean, the U.S. is a big place, um, and likewise, the rest of the world, not everywhere is a dense metropolitan area. Some places are suburban or yeah. rural, and it's possible that the nearest gaming store is an hour and a half away, <laughs> and your neighborhood, like, nobody plays games within a 40-mile radius. Yeah. And you still want to play the game, going online is a great way to do it. And, you know, if you're not going to buy the game because you just literally don't have anyone to play with, that's fine with me. I just want you to go online and have fun. I think that's something good. And I, I think that, you know, that's a good way to think about it, you know, that that there are people, you know, who don't have that accessibility to game stores uh, or other people. Um, you know, some people who are just who live by themselves. And like you said, they, they maybe... Some people are, you know, they enjoy that online aspect of just playing, you know, just with, with with friends that they meet, whether it be, you know, over just voice chat or no chat at all. But, you know, I think the that that mindset that you just want everybody to play the game, I think that's something that's that's very interesting and you know, something that's that's commendable. You don't you don't hear that often. Um, but let's 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 let people know um you know it's it's been it's been awesome kind of just talking with you but i want to give you the floor this is your opportunity ellie to kind of just say you know what this is my campaign this is when it closed it's all you let people know everything they need to know about world breakers you know this is your selling point put it put the best selling you know put that selling hat on and just give it to them sure so if any of the things we talked about think interesting please go to the website please go to the Kickstarter campaign, take a look and see if something you're curious about. Um, the game is available as a print and play and um, tabletop simulator and tabletopia. So don't make a pledge until you try it. I mean, just open it up in one of these platforms, have a look at the cards, take a look at the rules, make an informed decision on whether you want it or not. Um, also, the game is being funded we're at over 200%. So even if you have the smallest doubt on the game, just don't back it, because it's going to be out in a few months. You'll be able to play it with one of your friends who backed, and you can make a decision there. With that said, if you like the philosophy, if you like what I'm talking about, if you feel confident and comfortable backing now, you have the money, you have the bandwidth, please do. Just go to wallbreakersgame.com and click on the Kickstarter link. Nice. And the, the link, I, I put that down there. Also, the link to the campaign for those who are watching is in the chat. And this is also, I'm going to be posting this on my YouTube channel for those that are going to be seeing this afterwards. And I'll put all that stuff in the description. But, you know, and what the final closing date, Ellie, what is that, that date that people need to know when this game is closing for those that want to back it? Uh, the campaign is closing this Thursday. So it's going to be March 31st. Okay. And if you're not sure about what you want to do, just use the tip jar pledge mm -hmm. level, uh, put in one buck, and then in a few weeks, you're going to get access to the pledge manager. So nice. if you feel comfortable, if you have the means, you can back now, do it now. If not, just put in one buck, wait a few weeks, and then make a decision. And I think that's awesome to hear. You know, um, I'll be honest, I am a big uh big believer in that one dollar pledge a lot of times it gives me that time to look over to look at a game or sometimes have a friend who might have a copy uh you know a prototype that might be able to send it to me or I might be able to link up with them to actually play a game before i make that final decision i think that's always big i i, I enjoy games that have or campaigns that have that one dollar pledge that give you the opportunity to really dive deep just because you know the hustle and bustle of life, um, I, myself, you know, the hustle and bustle of life, being able to always get everything to the table when you need it, or really just dive into the websites. I think um, to be able to have that, you know, flexibility. But like you said, you know, and that's something that you don't hear. If these, like you said, if you don't believe in in the game yet, you know, it's going to be coming out shortly. It is a game that is one hundred percent funded. It's been funded double over, um, you know, over two thousand percent. And like I said, we're we still have a couple more days left, so we will see where that. That's at but this game is coming is coming to backers it's going to be coming and you have that opportunity um is this something that is going to be hitting retail stores um fairly soon after fulfillment is that the plans um so just a quick correction 200 percent oh 200 200 percent sorry <laughs> i wish it was 2000 <laughs> um yes the goal is to reach retail 
And um, retail is probably going to take a while longer than the Kickstarter campaign. So actually, one of the big benefits of pledging to the Kickstarter is just you're going to have the box out of, of the stores. Um, sure. Distributors don't really like small publishers, unfortunately, but some of them do. So there's negotiations and talking to a few options. It's going to get to the stores. It's going to take a while longer. If you want to be their first pledge to the Kickstarter campaign, you'll get the box in the mail. Awesome. Awesome. Ellie, it's been an honor having you on. I'm just being able to talk with you to just find out a little bit more, not only about World Breakers, but about you, you know, your, 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 your concepts, your mind behind the game, where it stemmed from, the passion behind it, because I, I can tell this is a passion project for you. And that's something that, you know, when you really see designers, especially, you know, people who are coming into first time design, first time game coming into the market, you know, when you see the passion behind it, that's what makes this hobby so great, right? Is not only the passion behind the designers and publishers that ha that, that want to pour that passion into the community, but the gamers, content creators, when you see it, it's a passion. It's something that we all can appreciate. So I want to thank you for having you on to be able to share um, World Breakers with everyone who is watching. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I love your oh, channel, and I'm super excited to be here. No, thanks so much for the support. And I'm going to do my sign off. But again, thank you so much, Ellie. So there you have it. That is Ellie Amir, the designer of World Breakers. Like I said, this one is going to be ending the Kickstarter campaign this Thursday, March 31st. Go check out worldbreakersgame.com. The description, if you're watching this on YouTube after this airs, the description to the Kickstarter link is going to be down below. You guys can go check that out before the campaign closes. But worldbreakersgame.com is going to give you everything about the game. It's going to give you um, the links to their Discord, the blog notes, as you can see, the design process of this is going and where this game is going, where it's come from and where it's going, as well as the YouTube page that they have over there. So definitely, definitely go check this one out if this is something that is up your alley. But like we say here at the Lobby of Hobbies, it's all about sharing the games that you love and hopefully this, someone discovers something worth checking out. I want to thank you guys for stopping through and checking this one out with me, having this conversation, this little interview, this lobby sit downs. But if this is your first time here at the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button, smash that like, drop some comments down in this YouTube video when I, when I put it air it put it, Eric, you know how we do it. Um, but when we put it live on YouTube, I want to thank those that are here in the chat. My buddy, James, James, it's always nice seeing you um, stopping through and just having talks with games um, with you. So but again, I'll check you guys out on the next one. Mm -hmm.